G'day, I'm James, and welcome to video five on our very complete and robust story of quadratics. Now, we spent the last four videos talking about the algebra of quadratics, where the story really was the power of symmetry, how symmetry is our friend to use the quadris method to solve equations by doing symmetrical thinking. Of course, there's one little place where we could break symmetry in one special case, but really, the thrust of our story was about the power of symmetry. Now, today, I want to talk about the graphing of quadratic equations. And we'll find out that actually the story of symmetry is a powerful theme as well. Symmetry really is our friend. But before I get us going, and before I show us the opening puzzle, let me just talk in general about what is mathematics. In fact, you know, what I really want to talk about is, you often hear people say mathematics is a language. And it's true, mathematics is a language. I am speaking to you in English right now, and the language of mathematics is English. If I was speaking to you in Hindi, the language would be Hindi. If I was speaking to you in Korean, the language would be Korean. And I mean it literally. Mathematics literally is the language one is reading and speaking at the time. For example, here's a statement in mathematics. It's this. 5 equals 2 plus 3. That is actually a sentence. I mean language. It actually is an English sentence. There's a noun, the number 5. There's a verb equals, and there's an object, the quantity 2 plus 3. This actually is a sentence, noun, verb, object. So technically, I should end it with a period, a full stop. In fact, mathematics so much is a language, you should be using punctuation when you write mathematics. Most people don't, but actually one should use punctuation. All right, so that's what I mean. Math is a language, literally, noun, verb, object. Let's turn that to be a true sentence, because 5 does happen to equal 2 plus 3. But not all sentences need to be true. For example, here's another sentence mathematics. 7 is greater than 4 plus 9. Okay, that's a valid sentence. Just turns out to be a false sentence. All right, but here's the thing. In mathematics, we tend to focus on true sentences. We find true sentences much more meaningful and interesting to study. We like to focus on truth in mathematics. So math is a language. The language is English right now, and it tends to focus on true sentences in English, which is interesting when you come to algebra, because algebra doesn't have specific numbers. For example, I can tell that sentence is true. I can tell right now that sentence is false. But let me write down this sentence as though it's some piece of algebra w squared equals p. All right, so it means w and p are just representing some numbers, but I don't know which numbers. So there's a noun, some unknown number squared. Here's a verb, equals. Here's an object, some other unknown number. I'm not told what w and p actually are. So that means right now, I don't know if this sentence is true or false. I mean, I need to know what W and P actually are. What's in your head for W and P? Your W and P might give a true sentence. I might have different W's and P's in my head, and I'll have a false sentence. It all depends. We don't know when this is going to be true and when this is going to be false. Except, except, we can start collecting the data from this equation that makes true sentences. For example, I could make a table of all the values W and P that give true number sentences. For example, if W was 2 and P was 4, I think I'll have a true number sentence. 2 squared equals 4. True. If, if uh, w was 3 and p was 9, a uh, 5, woo, 5, I would not have a true sentence. 9 doesn't equal 5. Numbers in my head. You're right. If this was 9, we'd now have a true number sentence. So it seems very natural in, from algebra, given an equation with some unknown numbers that you're not sure of, is to collect all the data of all the numbers that make a true number sentence. You do all sorts of weird things like w is 0 and p is 0, that'll be a true number sentence. Um, when w is negative a half and p is a quarter, that'll be a true number sentence. When, w, when p is pi and w is the square root of pi, that'll be a true number sentence. We can collect all the data that makes us a true sentence about numbers. Welcome to mathematics. Now, tables of values are fine, but people often like to visualize data as well. In fact, it's so much easier to see a picture. In fact, you can probably tell right now, my brain is very visual. I think pictures are much easier to understand and analyze than data and equations. So let's draw a picture for this data. In fact, that is what a graph is. A graph is a visual picture of a table of data values. All right, how? 
Now I'm sure you've seen this before, but I've got two unknowns, I've got a W and a P. So what I'm gonna do is draw a number line for all the possible W values, and I'll draw a number line for all the possible P values. Now, mathematics doesn't care where you put these number lines on the page, but it's become the convention to do one number line horizontally. Uh, so zero, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three and to do the other number line vertically, with the positive numbers going upwards. This is just convention. I could do the number lines in a different place, I could do them in a different order, I could put the negatives this way, this way, I could do things at 45 degrees, I could do all sorts of things. Mathematics doesn't care, just the society, we've decided to do it this way, two perpendicular axes. All right, so far so good, it's just a social choice. Next thing is, is this the number line for W or for P? Is this the number line for W or for P? Don't know, don't know. Again, the mathematics doesn't care which one you choose, but society tends to have an opinion. In fact, people might think what I wrote here is a little strange. They might prefer me to write, P is some formula in terms of W, namely it's W squared. They might like to think, oh, the value of P is somehow dependent on doing something strange to a value W. They might say like W is like the key variable here, like the, 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 the primary variable, and then P has to follow along by being whatever that value you choose there, being squared. In which case, they might call W the independent variable, it can take a whole range of different values, and P's value depends on what the value of W is, the dependent variable. Just a choice of thinking. This is not mathematics, this is just social convention right now. But following social convention, it's become standard to have whatever you think is the independent variable in your brain as the horizontal axis, and whatever you think is the dependent variable as the vertical one. Social convention. So I'll follow social convention. It looks like P is some formula in W. Straightforward formula, so it looks like P is depending on the values of W. This way, it's hard to see that W depends on the values of P. So that seems much more natural to see. Okay, now we'll plot the data. So example, here's the data point. When W is two and P is four, we get a true number sentence. Oh, I should look at blue now. We get a true number sentence. So what I'm gonna do, W is two. Where's two on the number line for W? Right there. And to represent it's got the matching P value four, we'll just go up a height of four. One, two, three, four, up to there. Height of four above two. And look, we can actually see the height of four because the fact we drew a vertical axis for P. So this point here represents the data value two, four. Two for W, four for P. This data point, three, nine would be nine high, way up here. W is three, P is nine. Uh, negative half and a quarter. Negative half for W, a quarter for P. Okay, that's about that data point. Zero, zero, zero for, for W and go up zero high, zero for P. In fact, I can go through and collect lots of data. When W is one, looks like P wants to be one squared, one high. When W is two, it's four. When W is one and a half, it's two and a quarter. One and a half squared, I believe, is two and a quarter. Oh, when W is negative one, P should be one. When W is negative two, P should be four. In fact, I can kind of see it's matching it's on the left and the right, because a negative number squared is the same as a positive number squared. In fact, you can see if you plot lots and lots and lots of data points, you get all the in-between ones as well. It looks like we're getting a visualization of all the data being a nice, symmetrical curve. Symmetrical curve. In fact, I could do, I'll do this in blue. It looks like this is the equation, so this is a visualization of all the data that makes this equation true. So people will say this is a graph of the equation of all the data that makes this equation true. P equals W squared. Great, I've just drawn a graph of, of, of this. All right, so there's all that data on the table, but I feel like I can see what's going on much more easily by actually drawing a visual picture of that data. All right, now you're probably on to me. People in high school don't like weird letters like P and W. Everyone's obsessed with the letters X and Y. So what I've really done here is I said, okay, let's call the independent variable X, because everyone seems to want to do that in high school. Let's call the dependent variable Y, because everyone seems to want to do that in high school. In which case, what I've really got here is the equation Y equals X squared. This is really a graph of Y equals X squared, with X being the dependent variable, independent variable horizontally, Y being the dependent variable vertically, voila. So I've just graphed a quadratic y equals x squared, a very simple version of one of these types of equations, one of these expressions. Beautiful, beautiful. And the thing to notice, 
we've got a lovely symmetrical U-shaped graph. Grand. Oh my gosh. Okay, that was my introduction. Now I'm ready for the opening puzzle. But let me clean the board and we'll get to that puzzle. Okay, see you in a moment. Okay, here's my opening puzzle. We just drew a graph of all the data that makes this sentence, y equals x squared, a true sentence about numbers. And we've got a plot of points that looks like this. Now I'm sure you've actually graphed other things in your life, so I could graph an equation like this, y equals 2x, all the data that makes that a true sentence about numbers. For example, x is 3 and y is 6 is a true number sentence. And you can plot the point 3 comma 6. And if you do that, and you might want to draw the table if you like, you draw a table, get some values, but you'll find if you do it carefully and have the patience, it looks like it's going to be a straight line going through the origin at some slope, actually slope 2. All right, but here's my puzzle. Imagine I did something very strange. What if I asked you to take this graph and add this graph to it? That is, add these two graphs together. What do you get? What shape graph comes out in the end? Okay, that's a very vague, bizarre question. I don't think that really makes sense what I wrote on the board in red. What I really mean is this. I'm going to take y equals x squared. I'll take the s squared formula and y equals 2x. I'll take the 2x formula and ask what happens if I add these two formulas together? y equals the x squared graph, a nice u-shaped graph, plus the straight line, 2x, what would be the graph of the combined effect? That is, if I plotted this thing, what would I get out? Now, there's a question here, it's kind of interesting. Because if you look at that, if I choose a value like 2, I know that's 4 high, right? And if I chose a 2 here, that would also be 2 times 2, y must be 4, also 4 high. So that means if I chose the 2 here, I'd be 4 high, and 4 high, I'd be up higher. Or if I chose, say, the 1 here, oh, let's make it 3. If I chose the 3 here, it would be 9 high. If I chose the 3 here, it would be just 6 high. So, but if I chose the 3 here now, it would be 15 high. So it looks like any number I choose on this graph is going to add a positive height, plus another positive height, gives me a positive height. So it looks like my graph is going up on this side somehow. Um, actually, right at zero, here I've got zero height, then I'm going to add to it zero height, so it looks like this point is zero height. So it looks like the graph is doing something going upwards. I don't know if it's a straight line, I don't know if it's curved, I don't know if it's wiggly, but it's going up. What's interesting though is this side, on the negative side, the negative part of the number line. Then things get a little bit confusing because look, on the negative side, I'm going to have some positive height, and at the same position I'm going to add to it a negative height, and my question is, so that positive height and that negative height cancel each other out? Does my graph basically become like flat on the other side where all the positive negatives cancel out? Or do the other positives go to win and make the graph sort of go up again? Or do the negatives win? Do the graph go down again? What happens on the left hand side if I actually plot the data from that equation? So here's my advice to you. Actually try it. Collect the actual data points that make this equation a true sentence about numbers. You know, try x equals 3. If x is 3, I'm going to have to get 9 plus 6. 15, like we said, 15. Go try a whole bunch of different data values and actually plot what seems to be going on for this graph. What's happening, particularly on the negative side? And you'll be in for surprise. In fact, I'm going to give the answer away in just a moment, well, later on in this video, but, you know, pause now if you like, and try to figure out what the graph of this is going to be, because it's actually mind-blowing if you think about what the answer is. It's actually mind-blowing. I mean it. So try it out.